This channel is concerned with the war galleys of classical antiquity. These ships were a triumph of technology, and like any technological wave, they allowed an acceleration of social and cultural development. This technology was lost until it was reconstructed in the 1980s, largely by the efforts of just three men. Since then we can better appreciate the contribution the war galleys of classical antiquity made to our heritage of knowledge and culture. Whilst galleys were dominant at sea for 500 years, everything about that era of naval history was different and in many ways intriguingly alien to our times. Interpreting many of the surviving historical accounts and archaeological remains relies on an understanding of how war galleys operated. In this video, we start with the war galley itself and define the key characteristics of these vessels. Galleys are a specific type of wooden ship. They can be confused with galleons or galleasses, and they are certainly not a floating kitchen. But the essential thing is that a galley can be propelled rapidly by oars, or it can sail. Rarely it can use a combination of the two together. Galleys have long narrow hulls which are lightly constructed, otherwise they couldn't be propelled by oars. Any ship with a sail will principally be a sailing ship because this is the most efficient way to make progress. They will cover most of their sea miles under sail. Although war galleys include the fastest oar-powered wooden ships ever devised, it was this capability married with the sail that was key to their success. And just to be clear, galleons, on the other hand, are three-masted sailing ships from the 16th to 17th centuries, a much more massive ship than a galley. The word is derived from galley, but became associated with the sailing ship later. And as for galleasses, they are slow, heavy war galleys with three masts. They were developed to carry more men and artillery in the wars between Venice and the Ottomans, again in the 16th century, long after the age of the classical war galley. Viking ships are an interesting group of types, which range between true sailing ships and true galleys, with most things in between. The broader, shallow hulls sail better in the northern seas, but the narrow galleys are fast transports for war bands. Here we can see the Gokstad type replica Niedhug sailing well alongside the Ladbuskip replica Aslak with its characteristic long profile suitable for rowing. Viking ships cannot all be classified together as true galleys, but the longer type certainly could be. Even by the time of the Viking era, galleys had been used for thousands of years. The first galleys we know of are from ancient Egypt, no less than 25 centuries BC. That's much longer before North AD than we are today situated after North AD. That's something to ponder. This is the oldest known depiction. It's from the pyramid of the pharaoh Sahure at Abu Sir. It shows the mast laid down and the oarsmen have shipped their oars and they're all praying or showing obeisance to the pharaoh. The last form of galley in use were the kanon sholupa or kanon bowl in the Russian, Swedish and Danish navies of the 19th century. They fought for the last time in both the Schleswig-Holstein War of 1848-51 and in the Bothnian campaign of the Crimean War in 1854-55. So galleys were actually only displaced in the mid-19th century by steam paddle launches, after thousands of years of use. Just what made this kind of vessel so useful to keep them in service for so long? Galleys sail well with their lightweight and simple rig, but if the wind drops and they're becalmed, whereas a sailing ship would be stuck, then Galleys just run out their oars, and off they go. And once the galley's oars are deployed, the galley can make a significant speed. It can make a useful strategic speed, something in the region of five knots at least. Galleons and sailing ships often have oars, or sweeps as they're called, 
for manoeuvring in port or when they're totally lost in the doldrums with no wind at all. But galleys make high speed, useful strategic speed under oars. Galleys can also make progress if the wind is from the wrong direction, whereas a sailing ship could only sail a certain direction up against the wind. Oars allow the ship still to make progress, even if it's not ideal. Another significant point is that among islands and shoals and channels, oars can be used to navigate where a sailing ship could pass, but it could only pass with extreme difficulty, a lot of tacking, and it might even have to deploy longboats to pull it round in certain directions. And then we have the question of draft. Shallow waters are dangerous for sailing ships with their larger rounded hulls. Galleys, on the other hand, usually have shallow draft, and they can go where the deep-drafted sailing vessels cannot. This navigational versatility made galleys very suitable in the Huergor of the Baltic, just as much as it had along the rocky coasts and islands of the Aegean in antiquity. Here are three areas where galleys operated very successfully in the 18th century. The archipelagos of Viken, around Stockholm and on the Finnish coast. The topographical similarities are immediately apparent. Time and again, galleys got the better of square-rigged sailing ships in these waters. In such waters as these, the small galleys were able to ambush and mob much larger, less manoeuvrable sailing ships and cause great problems for their opponents. Here, Danish cannonboats mob and board a British, a British brig during the war with England. As an illustration of the combats between square-rigged sailing warships, and the small galleys with their one or two cannon. We read of the following account where, on the 23rd of May, 1809, HMS Melpomene, a 38-gun frigate, was attacked by 20 Danish gunboats while becalmed. The action lasted for seven days in all before she could drive off her opponents. Five men were killed, 29 were wounded, and the ship was so badly damaged she had to be sold out of service. Here we have the seascape of part of the Danish archipelago and the Dodecanese coast of Asia Minor. Here we can see part of the reason why galleys made sense in these two disparate parts of the world at two distant time periods. So now we have the key capabilities of the galley. Ships, naval ships especially, need to get from A to B fast and reliably. High speed, that allows attack, escape and pursuit. And oar power gives the galley great tactical manoeuvrability, independent of the wind. Now these characteristics could be useful in any vessel on any mission, but especially for a warship, these characteristics are key. And if we add a weapon system, then we've got not just a galley, but we have a war galley. So along with the navigational capabilities, a galley for war needs an armament. The oldest weapon is the crew. Originally, the oarsmen also fought, known in Greek as autoritai, or self-rowing warriors. This was the typical raiding vessel of the Mycenaean period, of Homer and very similar to the later Viking longship. The Romans even invented a special device, a kind of boarding bridge, to ensure they could attack with their deck troops, the corax or corvus or raven as it was known, with missiles and later catapults. As ships became larger, the number of deck troops rose dramatically, and the cominus, as the Romans called it, or melee between these troops, became to ultimately decide most sea battles. Some date after galleys began to be used for warfare, they were furnished with a ram. This was a waterline projection of the bow, which could be driven into another ship's hull to disable or sink it. This was the weapon which made the war galley such a ferocious weapon system. 
all maritime states had to adopt the best war galley possible or be blockaded and blackmailed by their enemies. Starting as a simple spike, the weapon ultimately became the highly efficient trident ram, which could cut into a target's hull like a chisel. These were the weapons of state navies, war galleys which fought other war galleys. Pirates were never so interested in ram-armed galleys. They needed to capture merchant ships intact and favoured large crews on light, fast galleys, which they used from ambush. We'll deal with the development and use of rams in other videos. The ram fell out of use sometime in the 5th century AD, possibly due to the enormous manpower requirement of fast ramming galleys. And then the calcar, or treader, also known as the spur, became the principal weapon. So let's summarise the basics about war galleys of classical antiquity. In terms of time, the real age of the war galley is from 1000 BC to 500 AD or so. That means these ships dominated the Mediterranean for 1500 years. The key invention of the ram happened somewhere around 800 BC. This stimulated experiment in galley performance, which resulted first in the invention of the two-tier rowing system, and then within a hundred years or so, the invention of the ram. The ultimate in rowing systems was the three-tier rowing system. This happened sometime in the 6th century BC, maybe at Corinth, maybe in the east. And this gave rise to the Trieres, which was the ramming ship par excellence. The Battle of Salamis was the climax of the Persian attempt to subdue the Greeks, and hundreds of Trieres played their part in keeping the Hellenic states free from the Achaemenid Empire. And this took place in about 480 BC, which is actually 2,500 years ago this year. War galley development took its next important step with the invention of multi-manned oars around 400 BC. This opened the way for a series of larger war galleys of which the Pentires was probably the most successful. The age of the ram-armed war galley of classical antiquity was over. Finally, let's recap on the essential features of a war galley. The war galley is armed with a ram with which it can incapacitate or sink other ships and defend itself against attacking rams. The war galley has a long, slim hull which gives it speed through the water and ensures that it's light. The long hull allows the many oars to be deployed for propulsion and the oarsmen are arranged as compactly as possible to allow them to row efficiently to give the ship maximum speed. In addition, the war galley has a simple but efficient sailing rig with a single square sail. An essential part of the ship's armament were the deck fighters who made sure the ship couldn't be boarded. Later their number was increased and the capturing of other ships was a main tactic. So these were the basic characteristics of warships for 1500 years. This channel will range over all aspects connected to the war galleys of classical antiquity. There are the ships themselves, there are the men who fought in them, there are voyages made and battles fought, there are the installations which remain and what they tell us about operating war galleys, and I will delve into modelling and gaming connected with war galleys too. Please subscribe and hold a weather eye out for the next poopcast from Rams, Ravens and Rex. Feel free to comment, to ask questions or make suggestions for video subjects. KBO.